Well, thank you. Thank you. Um, great. Yeah, absolutely. Huh? <laughs> Let's get some energy flowing through here. I was telling all of them, like, just imagine that we're sitting by a fire. You know, it's your favorite drink of choice. And we're just going to kind of hash out the realities of athletics, retirement, sport, and what it means to engage in sport and society. So, yeah, we're in the trust tree. There'll be some opportunities for questions and discussion as well from you all. So, um, I, though we're set up kind of like Jerry Springer here, we'll see if it gets a little Jerry Springerish. I don't know who wants to be. Uh, who is the bouncer's name? And it was Steve. It was Steve actually. I'll be there. You go. I guess I'm the bouncer, right? Jerry and Steve. Um, so, so my name is Steve Grafe. A little bit of a background about myself and why I'm moderating this panel is uh, I too was a former student athlete here at Ohio State. I was a member of the football team from 2000 to 2004. And for those of you that are in the audience and you're kind of scratching your head and wondering like, man, I know every member of every roster since like the Eddie George days and Steve Grafe isn't ringing a bell. And don't worry that you're experiencing any memory loss. The reason being is that in order for one to technically have played football at Ohio State, one would have had to technically play. And I, <laughs> though I was a member of the football team, I'm a bit reluctant to say that I played. However, if you look deep into the video archives, there were two plays against Kent State when we were up about 45 points and there was 18 seconds left to go in the game in which your boy Uncle Steve got himself a couple of reps. So yes, we can. Dreams can come true. As you might imagine, uh, my days as an elite athlete ended upon receiving my diploma in Ohio Stadium and knowing that I wanted to go on and pursue greater things within the field of psychology. I got my master's and PhD at the University of Akron where I specialized in counseling psychology um, and then further cut my teeth into the special niche known as sport and performance psychology. And I had the great fortune of returning back to Ohio State in December of 2013 to be a sports psychologist for the Ohio State Buckeyes, all the programs and um, the various individual athletes as well. So gives me a little bit of knowledge and expertise to be able to moderate such a fine panel that we have in front of us today about being an athlete, retiring from sport, and some of the different aspects of how do you effectively manage retirement, what gets in the way of managing retirement effectively, and what are some other variables that make that difficult. But before we get into some of that nitty gritty, I don't know about you guys, but I'm really thrilled to kind of hear a little bit about who these panelists are what they've kind of been up to, and I suppose we will start there. So Prim, if you want to get rocking and rolling down there, that'd be awesome. Oh, you put me on the spot here because I think I'm the not the only uh, person not from that's not from Ohio or went to Ohio State. Unfortunately, I went to Duke. Don't hate me, but um, I was a tennis player and went there from '99 to 2003. Uh, picked up a racket at the age of seven and was born in a small town, Mexico, Missouri, and. Um, realize about the age of 10 that tennis was my thing. I did pretty well at it and it was something that I wanted to pursue. So I went to a tennis academy in Tampa, Florida um, called Saddlebrook. My mom actually came with me while my dad stayed in Missouri to support the family. So it was a massive sacrifice and that was a huge part of my journey just because it you know, inadvertently put some pressure on me and, uh, as a child and it was a huge just part of my identity. So anyways, I went to Duke thereafter, and then um, after I graduated in 2003, uh, I figured if I couldn't play sports, um, and if I couldn't be an athlete, I was gonna be around them, at least cover them. So I got into broadcasting, uh, spent the past 15 years there as a, in, in broadcasting as a sports anchor and reporter, and um, spent the last six years at ESPN. And then now I'm just kind of making a tra career transition into what Dr. Grafe is doing, something very similar, sports psychology, but also counseling psychology because um, I just realized I miss working with athletes and I'm really concerned about their well-being. So. I'm Joshua Perry. I uh, grew up here locally in central Ohio, graduated from Olentangy High School, um, played football here from 2012 to 2015. Started playing football at the age of nine, so it's always been a big part of my life. Um, something that I enjoyed, obviously, from a young age and thought I was going to do for a really long time. Uh, when I graduated in 2015, I ended up being drafted in 2016 by the San Diego Chargers, so I played there for a year. 
Uh, I played in Indianapolis and I played in Seattle before retiring uh, due to some injury concerns. So now I'm back here locally. I uh, sell real estate as my day job with Coldwell Banker. I am uh, on 97.1 The Fan, doing a little bit of radio commentary, and I coach track in the spring. So staying busy nonetheless, but uh, this kind of retirement transition out of sports is a little bit new for me. So I think this is a very important and salient conversation we're having today. And if you're in the need of a new house, my <laughs> man. Call your boy. The, that'll help with that retirement <laughs> a little bit too. Yeah. Cool, thanks, Josh. All right, hi, I'm Monica. Um, I was a synchronized swimmer here at Ohio State from 2014 to 2018, um, so I'm just new into the retirement life. Um, my mom was a swimmer in college, um, so she threw me in a pool, I think before I started walking. Um, and so I've been doing that pretty much my entire life. Um, and then around the age of eight or nine, I saw synchronized swimming at a local pool, and I was like, Mom, I gotta try this. And she's like, that's weird, no. Um, and I was like, no, no, I think I got this. So um, I tried that when I was eight, and I stuck with it. Um, I, when, I start, when I turned 15, I started moving to California to train with national teams. So I was on four national teams and got to compete at World Championships in 2017, which was unbelievable. Um, and then I came here to Ohio State. Um, I was originally from Arizona. Um, and then I moved out here. This was my calling to come to Ohio State, and it was an amazing experience. Um, so I retired last year, about a year ago, um, a couple weeks ago. Um, and now I'm in grad school here, um, studying sport management. Um, and I know that sports is part of me, it's innate inside of me, and it's something I wanna be a part of the rest of my, rest of my life. Um, and so I'm studying sport management, and I just started a new job in the camps office in Ohio State Athletics. So I get to stay around that sport culture, which I love and is instilled inside of me, so. Uh, I'm Greg Odin. Um, I started playing basketball in the fourth grade. Fifth grade, I was 5'10". At the end of sixth grade, I was 6'6". Six, six. So <laughs> I guess I made the right choice. Um, <clears throat> came here to Ohio State originally in 06, 07. Um, in 07, I was drafted number one in the NBA draft. Played for six years, um, then played one year overseas, and then retired and came back to school. And I graduate May 5th. And now I don't know what to do with my life. So. <laughs> but thank you all for that. I don't know what to do with my life. And what a very eloquent kind of way of putting the reality that many athletes, we as athletes, find ourselves in. Because frankly, I don't think that we acknowledge the, the ending, the inevitable ending of our athletic careers. And I'm just curious to hear some thoughts of how did you think about retirement while you were engaged in athletics? Did it come up in your mind? Was it something, no, I worry about that when it comes? I'm, I'm kind of curious about that. And, you know, Monica, do you have any kind of thoughts on that? Sure. Yeah. Um, I think my end to sport was a little bit different, um, where I knew it was coming. I knew the date. I knew when it was going to happen. And it was in our minds, we're like, all right, that's the day everything's going to be over. Um, and I think our, like probably my senior year, I was like, man, I can't wait to be done. It's gonna be great. I can go out whenever I want and not to worry about getting up at five in the morning to get in the pool. Um, and I thought it was gonna be amazing. And I was so excited. Um, and that day came and it was amazing. We got to celebrate. We ended on a national championship, which was extraordinary. Um, and the summer felt pretty normal because we usually get to go home and train and kind of keep ourselves in shape before season comes back and then once the fall hit and everyone started coming back and the new members of the team um, started arriving onto campus, that's when it really hit me. I was like, all right, this is not my life anymore. Um, and I think I just started to think about my life as an athlete a little bit different then. And I was like, okay, this is really over. Um, and I didn't know how to process it. Um, and so the only thing I could do was to reach out to people and be like, I'm struggling with this. You know, I lost my support group. I lost like the structure of my day to day life. Um, and I don't know how to handle it. So I think the biggest part for me was talking to people and just being open about it and confronting it head on instead of just like keeping it hidden down inside of me. Um, so yeah, but I knew it was coming, but part of like just inside of me, I, I didn't really process it until way after the fact. Great. Josh, you have this opportunity, you get, you get drafted, have a successful career at Ohio State. Things are looking bright. Um, how were you kind of chewing on this, this aspect of of retirement, uh, it's down the road. How were you feeling about it? So it's a, a little bit of a unique scenario, I think, in the mind of football players. 
where you understand that you want to play professionally and you want to be able to make that career as long as possible. Uh, so for me, part of it was, okay, let me focus all of my energy and effort into my craft. But the other part of it's like, when you're in high school, you still plan for college while you're still in high school. And when you're in college, you still plan for your next, your career while you're in college. So for me, I had to be able to plan for what I wanted to do, um, but also keeping in mind that I wanted to play football for a while. The tough part for me was how abruptly my career ended because I was going into my third year in the NFL and I had sustained my sixth concussion. Um, and I had six of them from the time I was a sophomore in high school until my last one playing last summer. So um, everything kind of sped up. The timeline really sped up for me. Uh, but I would say the one good thing was some of the planning that I did, the support system that we had. Coach Meyer did a great job with the football program in terms of preparing guys for when the cheering stops. So we had workshops, we had people come through, speak to the team, we got introduced to different careers. Uh, but for me, it was kind of decided. So playing in the NFL was really my second dream. This is kind of wild. But my first dream when I was nine years old, we moved here to Columbus. Uh, my first dream was to become a realtor. And so that's what I'm doing right now, mm. interestingly enough. So I had kind of prepared mentally to do those things. But at the same time, it's not real until it's real. So I got back in August. And um, I went to start taking my classes to get licensed in September. But part of me was like, all right, let me find some other things to do. So that's how I started picking up the radio gigs. I uh, started doing a little bit of TV stuff as well, just to almost prolong it and hold on to the sports as long as possible. But the other aspect of me says this is something you wanted to do for a while. Number one, number two, you need to make some real money. So go ahead and dive in and do it. So um, it was it was always kind of a weird balance being able to say that you're an athlete first and foremost, and you're chasing that dream. But at the end of the day, like you know, your knees are only good for so long, so you got to be prepared for the next step. Mm -hmm. So that that plan B was was very helpful in that, and Monica, that support that was kind of floating around. So kind of taking little notes here of some of these supportive factors that can help when it ultimately comes time to retirement, which we're definitely going to get to. Greg, early draft picked, number one, killing it at Ohio State, similar as, as Josh. Retirement, what were your thoughts and feelings about that? Well, since I worked out today on the court, I didn't quite retire. My man. Um, <laughs> no. It, it's one of those, for me, it was a little different because I never thought this was going to be over. I thought I was going to keep on playing. And you never really look at the end while you're playing. But, you know, when you see it, it's like, oh, gosh, did I really prepare? And it kind of caught me off guard. You know, I, I went a whole month really without talking to people, without knowing what I'm doing. It, to me, it was just a whole month of wake up. What are you going to do today? I don't know. Walk outside, work out. I don't know what I'm going to do tonight. And it's really a whole bunch of loss for me until you really get that support. And for me, it was calling Coach Mata and just realizing that I needed to do something with my life. And that's when he gave a branch. And he was like, just come here to the gym, watch practice, be around guys. And that really helped me out to give me some direction, give me some meaning every morning. Great, great. Again, a huge support that you were able to reach out to. Prem, did retirement sneak up on you, and how were you feeling about the inevitability of that? Yeah, I mean, retirement was pretty clear for me because my junior year I had three consecutive surgeries. Um, so I had shoulder and both knees in three consecutive months. So it was pretty clear that um, my, my career was ending shortly. Um, on paper, I think if anybody looked at me and, and looked on the surface, they said, oh, you know what, Prem, Prem made that transition completely fine. You know, I, by my junior year, I decided I wanted to be in sports broadcasting. Um, and then three months after I graduated, I, I got a job at a telev television station. Um, but if you had asked me at 25, you know, how do you feel about retirement? I'd say, you know what, it's fine. I'm done with tennis. At 30, I would have been like, you know what, I'm done. At 38 now, though, um, I, I realize now that I was not prepared for the emotional turmoil and journey of coming to the, the grips of leaving sport. You know, I think that athletes are, we're, we're very conditioned to just suppress our emotions and be tough and, and stick it out um, and go on the quarter field and be a robot. And I think that that can become 
problematic in real life because it's really important to acknowledge those feelings um, and, and heal. And that's not something that I didn't do. So, you know, around, I would say, 31, 32 years old, I realized that I had been carrying a huge weight on my shoulders of not really being, to be honest and, and frank, not happy with how my career ended um, because it is, it, it happens so quickly. You know, and you're like, I spent my entire life training and trying to be the best tennis player or football player, or basketball, basketball player. And then you're like, did I do enough? Did I accomplish enough? And then, you know, you have all these questions. So, you know, um, I think my, my advice to a lot of people is like, just know that there's going to be an actual grieving process. You know, loss is loss and it's, it's um, I don't want to liken it to death, but it, it did feel like it, there was a part of me that died. And so it's normal to go through those feelings of sadness and anger and regret and guilt and, and all those things. Hmm. Well, since you brought up the reality of kind of this grieving process and emotions, um, I think that's when things get obviously the most deep because this, is, this, this being athletics is something that is so ingrained in us as a part of our identities. From a very young age, we got substantial reinforcement from it from coaches, from parents, from newspapers. And so when that's gone, where does that reinforcement now come from? So much of that has been external, and now we have to find a way to have it more internal. So speaking to those emotions, uh, what types of feels did you all experience go as you went through this process of transitioning and, and retirement? Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, yeah, I think Prim just really hit the nail on the head. Um, at first, for me, I was just kind of numb to it. I was just like, this is just going to be normal. This is my life now. Um, and then, like I said, like once I saw the new swimmers coming in, that's when it really hit me. And you do experience like the loss and hurt, and you just feel like you are lost inside. Um, and like she said, you know, as an athlete, you're ingrained to shut up and work, you know? Um, and so that's what I did for a while. I was like, this is not an issue. You know, I can carry this burden and just live about my life. And like, I very quickly learned that I couldn't. Um, and that's when I would find myself like at night just like super lost and sad. And I was like, okay, why am I feeling so sad? Um, why do I feel so lost? And what do I need to do to keep going? Um, and that's like why I said talking with people and just um, realizing that there are other people that are going through the same feelings um, and other people that are retiring from sport that are going through the same thing. And if you don't talk about it, you don't know that people are also feeling that same way. Um, so I think just being open about it has really helped me to heal. And I don't feel like I have finished like my healing process since leaving athletics, um, but it certainly helps me to be open about it and be like, look, whoever I'm talking to, this is how I'm feeling. I feel a little bit lost in, in myself and I feel like I don't have a directional path and just being able to be open about that. People can give you ideas or help you kind of circumnavigate the situation. Josh? Yeah, it's, it's interesting that, that shut up and work thing. I think it's, it's really, that's the real part about it. So um, when I first stopped playing, uh, one of the first things I did was I went out of town. I went to Mexico just to kind of clear my head and you know think about what the next steps were, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so that was kind of a way for me to to disconnect from things for a little bit But at the end of the day, you gotta you gotta answer the question about how you truly feel and I think The part that makes that most real and the the, the toughest thing about that is uh, When I first stopped playing the question everybody would ask is are you still playing? And then you say no and they ask you why and then you go through all of that So every time somebody would ask that question that would bring up all the emotions inside that I was feeling about retiring from sports and so that's tough, but the other thing which is wild is um, that emotional relationship that I learned from sports it, like it leaks into other relationships that you have so you know with your significant other you feel like you're not as open as other people generally would be because you know football players you're tough guys like you're not supposed to be sad if you have a bad day at work it doesn't matter like you know just get through it go back to work next day is the next day um, not to harp on all those things so for me one of the hardest things in general is being open about emotions and dealing with them, but especially when it comes to talking about something I hold so near and dear, where you know I've, I've played football and more falls in my life than I haven't played football thus far. It's really hard to kind of open up those wounds sometimes and really talk about it, but something that I need to do. Great, anything else? Yeah, yeah um, can I get rated off or what? 
Yeah, I think so. I mean, Ohio Union is where the party happens. There's a bar, there is a bar in here, so if you get rated R, you get rated R. I think it's 21 and over in here anyway. <laughs> no, because she had mentioned numb. And uh, I remember throughout the summer, after I got done playing in China, I want to say it was February, by the time I got back, I probably drank every day. So basically numb myself to even get those feelings about how it was that, you know, it was over. You know, I'm not coming back. I'm not playing no more or, or no team wants to look at me right. And then that, again, is messing up because I'm drinking every day. So even if somebody did see me, they're like, oh, I don't even know if I want to speak to him right now. So I kind of isolated myself um, with the alcohol and staying away from people knowing that, okay, you were the number one pick, but the second pick is the best player in the world right now. You know, well, besides Brian. Mm. But, <laughs> I mean, it, it it does get to you, but then you just keep on just numbing yourself and just trying not to think about it until you find some direction. Well, I'm really glad you brought that up, Greg, because that is a reality that a lot of athletes face. If we've never been in a situation where we've had to effectively process our emotions, what do we know what is easy for us? Well, we know it worked on a Friday night going down here, so maybe that's something that I'll continue to turn to in my life as well. Um, other folks experience, maybe not necessarily the alcohol use or anything, but other ways of just kind of numbing um, or avoiding the situation in, in, in your particular way. Uh, I definitely did. So, I mean, to me, in my opinion, um, everybody, everybody has a different coping mechanism, right? You know, for Greg, it was alcohol. For me, it was eating. Mm. So I, I had developed an eating disorder, um, ironically, as a result of an injury when tennis was taken out of my life at 18 years old. Um, and it, it kind of fluctuated when I was in college, but it really reared its ugly head when I left sport. Because now I was like, you know, as an athlete, you can judge yourself by um, how much you practice, whether you lifted, how much you trained, um, wins, losses, who I beat. And then now I went into the real world and I was like, I have no idea how to judge myself. And I have no idea how to place value on this person who, you know, when people ask, what are, what are you? And, you know, you're like, well, I was a student athlete, but I'm not anymore. I guess I'm just, I'm just prim. And in, in my head, even though I know I shouldn't have thought that, it wasn't enough. So uh, to be honest, you know, I, I, I battled it for a good 10 years and around the age of um, 31, I was like, you know what? I can't fix this myself. I, I know that what I did in my teens and 20s is not something that I can continue um, if I want to become uh, a healthy and, and better individual. And so that's, that's what I need to do. So it took six to seven years of therapy um, to, to really fix that. Wow, good for you. So for me, it was one of the, the interesting things. Like I stopped playing ball and I was going to the gym regularly and then after a while I just stopped. So there was probably like a three month period where I just didn't work out at all. Cause I'm sitting there like, all right, well, if I'm not playing ball, like what am I really working out for? So that kind of took me out of my routine. And then you know how it goes, like you don't start your day off on your routine and then you feel shitty the rest of the day. And so you're just kind of going through trying to, it's almost like you're grabbing at things to, to try to feel good so for me I think probably one of the biggest things was like that sucked um, probably like legitimately gained 15 pounds doing that but then it's everything else like now you're out of your routine so you have a bad day but like I said I'm not an emotional guy so I'm not going to talk about my bad day and so those things start to build up so the hardest thing for me was trying to figure out what routine was going to work and how to put myself in that mode to where I'm not going to wake up depressed. I'm not going to skip my workout. I'm not going to skip my routine. I'm going to get up and I'm going to hit the ground running. Monica, anything else to add? Yeah, I would agree with Josh. The same thing. Like you lose your routine. Like I knew every day I was going to wake up at six, work out. I was going to go to class, and then do my homework. And that was boom, boom, boom every day. I knew that's what I was going to do. And when you lose that sense of routine, like you're saying, you're like, okay, why does it even matter? Like if I go to the gym, it doesn't. Um, but then you realize, like over time, that it's more about just like keeping yourself happy and keeping yourself mentally like sane and happy um, and that it doesn't have to be a four hour workout anymore. I think that was really hard for me to try and realize that I don't have to be in the pool for six hours anymore. You know, <laughs> I can do an hour just running or I can, you know, go play sand volleyball with my friends and 
that's like just as good now um and i think i didn't really express like any emotional abuse or eating disorder but i felt a lot of guilt and a lot of anger um i felt guilty being mad and being sad about being retired um because i think i was like thinking in my head like there are so many bigger issues in this world than me not being an athlete anymore so i felt guilty about being mad and upset about that um and then i would get very angry when i was seeing people like competing or like going to championships and i'm like i want to do that still but i can't i don't have the opportunity to do that at ohio state anymore um so just feeling that like guilt and anger just really you know gets to you so um yeah that was kind of what i felt after i retired wow so, so much rich stuff even coming from these four individuals that i think offers a really great microcosm or metaphor of how individuals in general are going to respond so there's four individuals here and you're getting four different responses that permeates throughout the entire athletic culture of each individual is going to handle retirement a little bit differently and just as a little bit of a coaching point when they're speaking about this kind of grieving process one i want to really hold an asterisk to process it's not like you spend a week in x stage and then you move on to y stage and then the next thing you know you're feeling good about it it really is a process that kind of spirals in and out and you might think you're smooth sailing and the next thing you know you're watching a basketball game and you see kd donk and you're like shit ah oh. and you write back to that kind of feeling though maybe it's a little bit more temporary than what it was before it can sneak up on you and those emotions often associated with the with the uh, grieving process and i'd be curious to just get a raise of hands from the panel as i s speak to each one of those if you've felt this particular emotion it's dabda okay d stands for denial this isn't actually over okay a stands for anger are you kidding me this is over i'm so pissed off pissed off at myself pissed off at other people yeah bargaining which is oh man if i could just get one more play one more snap one more meet one more match mm -hmm. <laughs> d stands for depression so just sad about the reality that it's been time to retire and then eventually occasionally and then hopefully the majority of the time acceptance in times of acceptance that this is okay i get to have the opportunity to begin a new chapter yeah so right before you your very eyes you saw this process kind of unfold of these different emotions that can come up so uh, this change of mindset from when you were an athlete to now what is appropriate for you as an adult and maybe a less athletic maybe a more athletic adult how have you gone about changing that mindset of maybe less is more or maybe now i don't have to hit the gym as as much or maybe my routine can look a little bit differently and i'm valuing some other things as an adult than maybe what i did as an athlete this mindset change is just kind of bringing some curiosity within me so however it hits with you i'd be curious to hear about your own thoughts about mindset change for me i was very very strict as an athlete so i followed my routine i was up at a certain time i was asleep by a certain time didn't go out on weekends didn't drink etc and so retirement has brought a little bit of the, the fun back in terms of my schedule can be variable and I can hang out with friends and I can go have a few drinks and not feel guilty about it. And so I think that's one of the more valuable things now. Um, you know, I'm still about to turn 25 this month, so I'm still a young guy. There's still a lot of fun to be had. Um, so I get to enjoy that a little bit more, whereas, you know, I look back on my college days when I was playing in the league, and at times I feel like I wasted some good moments not spending time with friends and hanging out because I was so you know, had a one-track mind about achieving my dream of playing in the NFL. So I think that's one of the good things that's happened. Great. Uh, for me, I, I think it's recognizing what I enjoy. Um, now I have a two-year-old baby girl. So my time that I really enjoy that was going out partying is spent at home running around the house with her. Um, I think about like the times I used to work out. Mine was always just on the schedule. You know, it was I would have fun, but everything was on the schedule. As long as I got this done, then I can do this. And now it, it's taking out the big chunk of the sport. It's hard to fill up that time. My family does a great job of that now, but when I didn't have them, it was a lot of open time, a lot of time to think 
to myself, think positive and negative, mostly negative. Um, but now with my family, it kind of put some things in perspective and made me realize I need to realize who I am and what I like outside of that sport because once that's gone, that's most of your life. Monica, you kind of spoke to the mindset shift. Prim? Um, you know, uh, I, I've gone through different phases. I think after college, I was really sick and tired of tennis. Um, I think primarily because I was really unhappy with how things ended. So I, uh, I enjoyed the freedom. And then there was a period where I just got into a rut and um, I went to the gym and did the elliptical for an hour. And that was my way of getting that athletic energy out. Um, and then today, I, I think, I, I'm a gym rat, and I will always be a gym rat. So that um, drive to be in the gym and sweat and push my physical limits will never go away, and that's something that I realize. Um, and I, I feel like you don't have to shed your athlete identity. It's just going to look differently than what you have always known. You know, so you may not always, I, I, I'm not gonna go out and play matches um, or, or be training for four or five hours, but I can improve my strength. I can improve my, um, my flexibility. I can do yoga, I do boxing. I did Muay Thai for a couple years and tried to you know, get my black belt. You, know, you, just, you just have to get creative and find different goals. You know? um, and I, I think that's really worked for me, um, but it's also, I think what's helped is uh, my husband, who was a trainer, a lot of my friends who are in sports and uh, they do CrossFit and everything, and just, seeking their help and trying to figure out ways to um, shift your focus, especially for me with my eating disorder and my history, um, shift my focus away from anything that could me get me back in trouble. Mm -hmm. Say like, okay, mm -hmm. let's prove your you know, strength or whatever, so. I think one of the toughest things of when you're going through something or feeling some type of way is taking the steps to do something about it. And I'm sure that there's individuals in this audience who have found themselves in situations that are tough, or maybe you're in a situation that's tough right now, whether an athlete or non-athlete, career-wise or not, and how to make those steps and what do those steps look like to get yourself on the other end of that struggle and what's been apparent hearing you all talk is there was moments. There was a month of drinking every single day. There was an eating disorder that was developed. There was getting off of your routine and no longer exercising. And then eventually something happened or some things happened to start writing that ship a little bit. And I'm curious, because maybe there may be some takeaways for the audience here. For you as individuals, what helped set those dominoes in motion and what were those key influences that started getting that train going down the right track? Well, for me, it was just going back to the gym, uh, getting back around basketball, seeing the kids come in and realizing this is a game that I love. You know, I, I can't be out here drinking every day or show up around them with alcohol on my breath or with it coming out my pores. So I had to start being better. I had to start getting myself together just to be around them, to, to be a better example, because I, I don't want anybody to look at me that type of way or for me to influence them and then for me to see it and somebody tell me, yeah, he's been idolizing you, but now he's not doing anything because he's drinking and he's not a good person because he's seen that from me. I want to hold him. That's awesome, Greg. I want to hold a magnifying glass to it just for a second because I think from apartment or condo to gym at the time and where you were at in life probably felt like a thousand million miles away, mm -hmm. right? How did you make that determination of, I'm not gonna sit here anymore, I gotta go into the gym? Uh, How did that happen? Uh, a lot of crying, uh, uh, a lot of old YouTube clips, um, uh, and you know, KD. You, you know, yeah. I, I'm I'm watching KD just ball out, and it's like, dude, I, I still feel like I can do something, you know. And I didn't know I was gonna do it myself. I didn't know I was gonna still. I know I couldn't keep playing, but I knew I could use what basketball has gotten me to pass it on, just to be around it. So, start seeing that, and just the time going by, mm -hmm. and uh, also I, I had to 
stop drinking. I, I didn't have a eating disorder, but I became bulimic. I don't know if it was because I was drinking all the time, but I knew whenever I ate something, I knew how to throw it right back up. Mm -hmm. So it, it was a lot of negative going on with my health, with my mental. Um, and then at that point, I was just like, I, I got to get out of this house. It, it was a lot of me, but it was a lot. Coach Mata, my mom calling me, uh, my grandmother calling me, uh, coming to visit. Um, I had friends that would make sure I, I, I just couldn't stay inside the house. And I was thankful for them all the time because they got me to that place. Awesome. Awesome. So that mix of kind of these motivational clips that you started seeing and taking in and then that support system that just wouldn't let you down. They just kept poking at you. Well, I was down. They pulled me up. Yeah. So. Um, I think a really pivotal moment for me, kind of in my grieving process, I don't even know if she knows this, Dr. Bandy. She's one of my professors in undergrad. Um, and, yes, <laughs> give her a round of applause because she's amazing. <laughs> um, it was in the fall, and I was just having a really hard week um, watching the girls here train and just kind of in my feelings, like you say. Mm. Um, and I was walking through the office, and she – saw me she's like miss velasquez yeah come in and i was like all right here we go um and she sat me down and she's like how are you doing like with retirement and i just like no one had really asked me how i was doing with it and that was a moment for me where i was like i really am feeling all these emotions and they're really strong and they're really taking over me and that was the first time i realized like i have to do something about this i have to talk about it and i have to find ways to make myself happy and enjoy sport and enjoy my life after retirement so thank you because it really helped me move on in my grieving process wow you never know the impact that you're going to have on individuals right and at that time and in that place it was that person that that really was was a, a key figure Josh? well so one day i was uh i was getting ready for an appointment, so I was getting dressed. I put my dress pants on, they were a little snug. Um, <laughs> and so I went and I looked in the mirror and I'm just looking at myself like, damn, I, I'm a little bit doughy right now. <laughs> and like, it's, it's kind of bad to say, but like, I'm, I'm, I'm vain, like I like to look good. And I was just like, okay, this is, at some point it's gonna get out of hand. And <laughs> when football players retire, there's like this, joke like the big guys get little and the little guys get big and I was like on the cusp of a little guy I'm like I'm not gonna become one of the big guys so um, it just like it became a point where I had to tell myself enough is enough like you can sit there and feel sorry about yourself and get out of your routine but you're just gonna you're gonna feel like a sack of crap and then you're gonna look like one too or you could just get your mind right and get back into it so that kind of was it for me like I'm not gonna go around feeling dumpy and looking dumpy at the same time it's just not gonna happen for me like that those snug pants <laughs> to wake up <laughs> bad deal. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Prim. You know, um, I think I, I realized that I could uh, take the lessons that I learned from sports and shift it over into real life. So, you know, I realized that I needed help. Just like Greg said, the support system is really huge. So I knew I needed to heal and I knew that I needed help. So that came from my family, my friends and also a therapist. You know, in my head, I was like, listen, we go to school, we have teachers, we have sports, we have coaches. So why not, we, why can't we have a life coach mm -hmm. to help us become better people? And that's, that really helped make, helped me heal and make that turn. And then, um, you know, I, I really started um, using that same mindset to become a better person. So I was like, okay, if I don't have sports in my life and I can't really become a better athlete at this point, why don't I work on becoming a better person? And that's when my perspective on what identity really is started to change and shift. And I realized, I was like, you know, tennis will always be a part of my identity, but it's not who I am. And I think it had someone told me that, and there's a lot of people and, uh, that will say that to athletes, but had someone said that to me at 18 years old, I don't think I would have understood it. E even at 30 years old, I don't know if I would have really understood it, but now I do. And um, so I think that's really helped fuel my motivation is when I get up, I, I do everything that I can to become just a better person. So, um, because I don't have structure in my life anymore without tennis, so I get up at five in the morning, I journal, I get my emotions out, write some ideas, my goals, whatever, 
And then I meditate for 10 minutes. Um, I also do a lot of mental imagery about what I want to do, where I see my, myself going. And um, I've read a ton of books. And I think that's helped put me on the track towards becoming um, a, a better person and, and continuing, that, continuing that process of healing. Hmm. Well, you bring up a really good point about the certain behaviors and activities that for you promote wellness. Um, and I'm curious, I, I'm very curious from, from the rest of the crew, because we do different things to encourage wellness within ourselves. So uh, Josh, how do you maintain wellness now? Yeah, so that visualization part is big. Um, you know, I like to get up and kind of map out my day. What is it going to look like? What are my successes going to be like? And how am I going to attack my challenges? So that's been huge. But one thing I actually picked up rather recently, um, I went to the, uh, the radio station to do a spot. And so I was doing my show prep. And I sat down in one of the studios that was vacant. And I closed the door. And those things are soundproof. And it was like almost so quiet that I could hear my heart beating in there. But it was really good because I have so much in my life going on, so much to stimulate me that I probably needed that time to just be kind of by myself where it's quiet, where I can just be with my thoughts. And so that meditation piece as well, um, just being able to sit there for 10 minutes and, and not do a ton and just be with your thoughts and kind of, you know, let the things happen in your mind, you know, figure out a way to map it out, et cetera, or just sit there and not do anything and not think about anything um, has been really helpful. But probably the biggest piece for me is reconnecting with family because I've been a big family person but it seemed like when I left the sport I kind of disconnected from that a little bit too and so um, getting right and spending time with my younger brother and spending time with my parents has been huge. Being completely transparent I don't know if I found that balance yet. Mm -hmm. um, I mean I'm just a year out so I'm still trying to figure out what's going on in my life um, but I think as far as like schedule and day-to-day -day routine once I finished um, Synchro, I overdid it. I was like, I have all this time, and I need to find ev like an activity to fill every single minute of that day. Um, and I overdid it. I joined way too many things, took on way too many projects. You know how it goes. Um, so I think part of that process for me is learning how to say no and find a balance where I can do things right and do them well, while also being able to have time for myself and do things that I like to do. Um, and one of our friends, she's that graduated from our synchro program. She's a she's becoming a registered dietitian. Um, and one of her big things that she has, is speaking on is finding joyful movement. And I think that's something really big for athletes is you don't have to do um, activity that you don't want to do. Mm -hmm. And I think I get into that cycle of gym. I'm like, why am I on the treadmill? I don't really like running that much. <laughs> um, so just finding something that I actually enjoy and that will like bring me that peace of mind during the day. Yeah, that's that's great. Doing activity without feeling like you're engaging in physical activity is, is very cool. Uh -huh. And Greg, any uh, additional wellness tips? Um, so I want to say about five years ago, um, I went six months sober. It was a long time at the time, mm -hmm. um, but it, it put some things in perspective and helped me attack life a little bit differently. Um, and now I get up, I try to get up, and uh, ride the bike at home for 20 minutes and watch the highlights, either Sports Center or NBA Game Time, just to see basketball, keep my mind around it. Um, but then my daughter comes running down, and wellness for me is when I see her and realize that she's a sponge. So I need to be the best person I can be so she can see that and she can realize, you know, that's what a man's supposed to be. This is what a woman's supposed to be. And, and we need to be happy and we need to be good people. And she is a sponge. Oh, yeah. Boy, the ultimate accountability right there. Last night, she <laughs> ran into the room and said, Greg, pick me up because mom told me if I don't, uh, she's going to spank my ass. <laughs> <laughs> and my wife was asleep. So, I'm still <laughs> wondering where that came from, so. <laughs> <laughs> That's real talk right there, right. <laughs> we all need an ass bank every once in a while, don't we, folks? That might be a different convention, but never <laughs> <laughs> Um Wrapping up kind of the individual based, um, and then I want to kind of macro it out a little bit, zoom out a little bit, because this is a sport and society, so we... We, we don't want to let society off the hook because we got some words for society as far as athletics is concerned. 
But just quickly kind of identifying what's been awesome about retirement, because there is two sides of every coin, and I know really we like to present a particular picture because it can be challenging and it can also be pretty awesome. Um, and certainly if I would have said that the best years of my life were between 2000 and 2004, I would be crazy because as you might imagine, as a 37 year old with a man bun, life is pretty good right now, okay? <laughs> Do not lose any sleep for your pal, Dr. Grafe, okay? So, but I'm just curious, kind of around the horn, what's been some salient, really important pieces for you? And Greg, we'll start off, what's been awesome about retirement? Uh, the time, mm -hmm. um, just uh, the time and the uh, no pressure. Um, I used to go to every game I ever played, and I would just be nervous. I would get butterflies before every game. And so now it's funny because some days it will happen around around 5 o'clock, and I'll just be nervous for some reason. That's because uh -huh. you know, yeah. the games are at 7, so around 5 o'clock, I'm like, oh, gosh, what am I going to do? But now <laughs> most of the days, you know, I'm like, oh, I'm about to take me a nap. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> Naps are good, yeah. Monica. I'd have to echo that. The time is really amazing. Um, you get to spend time with your family, go on trips with your friends. Um, so it's been really great in the healing process also, just to be able to spend that time with people that you really love. Um, and then also just getting to take the skills that you learned in sport like out into the real world. Um, so it's been something that I've been very appreciative is that I have all these great skills that I've picked up from my teammates, from my coaches, from my sport, and I'm able to share that with people that I work with now or kids that I work with. Um, so I think that's pretty special. I would say a similar thing. Um, what's what's been really fun is uh, my new career. I can be competitive. You know, trying to find a listing, trying to trying to find your your buyer client, the best home, etc., has been fun for me because now I get to be competitive in a different way. Um, it's it's just really. I think it's just like Greg said. You you just feel more relaxed. You feel like you can you can do fun things. You feel like you can spend time now. Um, if you go off schedule, you go off schedule. Like it ain't that big a deal. Um, so that's been really cool for me. And then probably the final thing, which I really enjoyed, when I was playing, I started a charity. Um, we work with kindergarten through eighth graders, and now I get to spend more time around the kids, um, which is a really big passion of mine. I'm coaching track as well, uh, so I get to spend some time around high schoolers every day, um, just teaching lessons and learning from them because I'll tell you what, spend time around some kids will teach you some things too. So <laughs> that's been a ton of fun for me. Yeah, I mean, I, get, I echo everything that everybody said. You just have more time, you get to explore. Um, new interests and and try new things spend time with family and friends uh, I, I think a lot of athletes social lives and f familial relationships take a huge hit because we're so we're we have to be kind of selfish to excel at what we're doing um, but I think I would also add that you know you reached a high level in sports and it doesn't have to end there you can reinvent yourself and you can evolve and you can progress and and make new moves and shifts you know when I when I quit tennis I thought that was kind of the end of maybe an elite level of some sort and then I got into sports broadcasting and then you know I I got on air and then I went to ESPN and got to host sports center and all these things that I had aspired to do in college and we, we started Spain and Prim, which was the first ever all-female radio show in broadcasting history. Um, and now I'm making a career shift. Uh, and, and there are just these new goals and new things that you can do with your life. And in, in the smaller picture, it might seem like, well, you know, what else is here? What, what else is after this? But your biggest gift or achievement or um, greatest realization may be yet ahead you know, whether it's five, 10, 20, 40 years down the road. So I would just encourage people that don't be afraid to just turn the page and start a new chapter. Mm. Seems as though that the way out of such an obsessive kind of arena is through diversification and, and exploring new things. So it's kind of ironic that such soul focus and, and laser focus how you get away from that is through that diversification, which it sounds like you all are doing. Um, so shifting gears a little bit, uh, let's zoom out a bit. And obviously this is titled Sport and Society. Um, and so culture is something that's kind of bubbling up in me. And I wanna leave that vague enough to allow the panelists to kind of speak to how culture and the way that you wanna choose to talk about culture 
impacts your integration in sport and your retirement as you see see fit. So I'm just gonna kind of leave culture open-ended a bit and um, whoever wants to get started with that <laughs> bomb of a question, feel free to, to do so. Um, <clears throat> I guess I would look at it um, in society as being an ex number one pick and playing in the NBA, I felt I came here that I need a big house, I needed a nice car. And when those checks aren't coming in no more, you that mortgage is still coming. You know, that car note's still coming. So just realizing, you know, it, it's, you, you need what you need. You don't need the excess. And speaking on the culture, right now the culture looks like it's so much excess, excess my mm -hmm. bad. Um, and yeah, that's tough because when you do have that free time and you do have some money in the bank, you don't even think about that money's running out. And when you get a certain amount of money, you're not even seeing it. You know, as an athlete, you know, I, I just get some financial people and I trust them and I'm thinking my bank account's good. But now I'm not playing no more and spending the same like I used to. And I'm looking at, I got the time to look at these accounts now. Yeah, no, it's, it's not good. <laughs> <laughs> So that culture of like materialism and excess and mm -hmm. capitalism and, and more is better, that gets ingrained in the, the athlete mindset and you kind of, you, you pursue that and take advantage of that when that opportunity is there and then when it's not, it, it changes. It's that. taking advantage of you. It's taking advantage of you, well said. And I'll speak to that just mm -hmm. from like a, a football standpoint because it happens, I feel like, in, in money sports where, where people are making money, but the pitfall in football is, um, all the guys are always looking for attention because nobody sees your face. You see a guy in a cage, basically. You got a helmet on. And so it's like the locker room's a pissing contest. And when I got to San Diego my rookie year, I watched five vets sitting there, and they're playing um, poker for, like, five grand a hand. And, like, yeah, so it's not just the cars and it's not just the homes. It's watching that. And then as a young player, you're like, well, you know what? These guys aren't going to keep me out of the game. Now, I never jumped in, but I watched a lot of rookies do it. And you're on a, a, a minimum contract in terms of your salary. Your signing bonus is what it is. But that's how people get into that kind of trouble. So um, as you transition out of sport, for somebody like me, my relationship with money had to change to where you know, you're you not getting the same thing. There was a, a, a while there uh, because you, know, you only get paid during the season. So I went January. Um, I got a check in March. And then when I went to OTAs, we were getting a little bit of money. But then I retired. So basically that whole year, I hadn't seen like a, a real check. And so my retirement was like, OK, time to change a relationship with money. But there was the whole basically eight months before that where I was spending like I was going to be playing the next year. And so like that's where if I could go back in time, I would tell myself to prepare financially just a little bit tighter. And it wasn't anything out of control, but it's something where it's like, it's a little bit regrettable that you lost eight months of only spending money and not making any. Uh, so that was kind of a tough thing where not only do your personal relationships change in the way you think about yourself, but like also the way you think about money and how you spend it has to change too. I think um, there's too much of an emphasis on culture. Uh, there's a culture of winning at all costs. I think that a while ago, maybe let's say 20, 30, 40 years ago, um, sports was less commercialized, internationalized, and people did it for fun. It was more for fun. I think now there's just so much money involved. And when there's money involved, then you involve power, politics. And I think the thing that really bugs me is seeing it at the youth level and seeing how the dynamics of sport changes because these coaches are so focused on winning. So I'll, I'll take it out of my sport and, and talk about uh, basketball. And I, I have a lot of uh, friends or colleagues who are coaches. They play, maybe they played in the NBA or didn't, but they're seeing it at the AAU level where a lot of these, and Greg, I'm not, I, actually I sh shouldn't talk about basketball because you could probably talk more about this. Because, <laughs> no, because, <laughs> <laughs> but from what I hear is, from some of the parents is that, um, these players aren't being exposed to other positions and the AAU coaches maybe might be more focused on winning. So everybody is positioned 
you know, at the one, two, three spot, and they learn less about the fundamentals of basketball, and as they go on into college, and then, then they're not learning the fundamentals of the sport, but also there's not that emphasis on, you know, what, what sport can be, which is a vehicle to teach them about morale and character and life lessons. And I, th I just think that's, um, that's the one thing that I've really noticed over the past decade. Culture of win at all costs, and this culture of we got to start it early. We we have this um, uh, obsession with sport, and it's almost bigger than what it ever used to be in the in 20, 30 years ago. And so that's trickling down even to the youth level. Of we got to win. We got to show. We got to have the fancy uniforms. Yep, yep. Mm -hmm. Monica, any thoughts? Um, a couple. I mean, I guess I can talk about it more from like the smaller sport level, um, coming from synchro, and where even in the smaller sport, like we see that kind of like money centric focus. Um, and I think uh, our training hub is in the most expensive part of the United States for USA Synchro, it's in Northern California and it's becoming more about who can afford to train out there r rather than who has the talent to train out there. Um, so if your parents have the money to live, pay for you to live out there and pay for you to train out there and pay for the expensive coaching, then you're gonna be good. Mm -hmm. So what happens to the girls that can't afford that and are not getting the same level of training and don't have the same amount of opportunity. Yeah, and I imagine we see that the same same thing in tennis. Uh, oh, it's it's pretty right. bad. Yeah, I mean, it, actually, I um, it, we were talking about the grieving process and denial and what was another one of the sages denial and bargaining. Mm -hmm. um, well, I apparently did not do that 15 years ago. So I came out of retirement to get closure <laughs> and decided to go play tennis again and tried to play professionally. And I did for two years. But, and, and that was a really important because this time I didn't have the support of my family. And I was in between jobs and careers and I was like, you know what, and thankfully I had the support of my husband. And I was like, I feel like I really need this, you know, in, in, in order to get over this hump of like healing and feeling happy with my career. And then one thing I realized is just tennis is so expensive. It's impossible for these kids to support themselves, you know, because it's such a, an international sport, so then you're flying all the way to Turkey and Poland, and at, at the professional level, if you win a $10,000 tournament, you get like $1,000. Mm -hmm. And I lost, and, and three consecutive tournaments, I lost in qualifying. So then you're paying all this money for hotels and travel and all this stuff, and you're walking away with like nothing. So it's, um, it is very palpable in tennis. In tennis. Uh, we're blessed to have, at least on the panelists, we have we have two men and two women. So this reality of gender as another culture, um, I think, warrants a, a bit of discussion too. So how do you think gender shows up um, in the particular sports that you play as it relates to retirement and how you're viewed as an athlete or former athlete in society? This one's a little bit of a, a weird one because, you know, like football is the – the manly sport, like, you know, everything's macho about it. And I think it's really problematic to approach it from that sense because, I mean, it starts on it, really in high school, but when you get on college, like, the campus culture in general is, it's, it's just, it's super hinky. And so you get into these things where, you know, big man on campus and you're trying to pick up girls and X, Y, and Z, locker room talk, all those kinds of things. Um, and so being the man in the locker room who's able to say enough is enough and we're not going to speak about people this way, et cetera, like as a, a, a male athlete on campus, you're not going to look down upon female scholarship athletes as less than because they work just as hard to get here, even harder to get here than we did. I think that's a bigger part of the conversation. Um, and so what that leads to a lot of times from my experience is like, you're a loser, you know, like what's wrong with you? You know, you're supposed to be out there chasing, et cetera. So I think kind of that dynamic, I know, you know, this is a little bit, might not have been the exact question, but like that's mainly what I see is how um, gender roles in society are kind of magnified as an athlete where you're in a sport where you're supposed to be manly, so now you're supposed to have the beautiful girl and you're supposed to be chasing, you're supposed to see how many notches you can get on your belt and all that kind of thing. And I think it's, it's something that we need to approach kind of as we're grooming our our young athletes to where, you know, the best player in your high school is not getting a pat on the back from everybody and your teachers aren't telling you that, you know, your coaches aren't telling you that you're the hottest thing smoking. And then when you get to college, you don't get to have preferential treatment. And, you know, you don't feel like people should be throwing themselves at you because it's just not the way it should be. Um, and 
athletes definitely have to take the lead on that conversation, which I'm not seeing enough of. But I think it always bothered me just a little bit um, in terms of how not even the guys who were doing it, but guys who watched and you know just sat and saw the things happen never really spoke up about it. Mine's like a little bit different, but I kind of want to go off of what Josh was talking about um, and that kind of being a student athlete at Ohio State and a big revenue producing sport, um, you don't talk poorly about women's sports that don't produce revenue. And coming from one of those sports that didn't produce any revenue, um, I mean, I would like to say that Ohio State has like a really amazing culture and I never felt like there was that kind of animosity between sports that are producing revenue and sports like mine that were being supported on the revenue that Josh's team made. Um, so I think that was, it, Ohio State's a very special atmosphere where we don't have that kind of power struggle. Um, but I don't think that can be said for the rest of our country and the rest of the world, um, where he was talking about how you don't speak to women's teams like they're lesser, where I think a lot of that also comes from ourselves. Um, and I know it's not a healthy way to think about it, but I mean, it definitely crossed our minds like, you know, like, oh, we aren't producing revenue, and so we aren't as deserving of the treatment and the preferential treatment um, that bigger teams are producing. So I think in order to see, like, that kind of change in our country, it has to start with us, like, realizing that you are just as deserving of praise and recognition because you are putting in the same amount of work, if not more in some cases. But, um, I mean, it's a little bit different than a uh, male atmosphere, but I think that's a diff definitely a prominent thing in women's athletic culture. Well, it's an interesting point. I mean, even in my introduction, I said in order for one to have played football, you have to technically have played. So as a, as a walk-on, there's very much even that kind of difference of how I perceive myself and how the walk-ons perceive themselves as compared to the, to the scholarships. And so you could see that between sports as well, and you could certainly see that within sport between starter and not, not starter, and how do we talk to ourselves and how do we introduce ourselves as – Oh, hi, I'm Monica, the, the synchro, or oh, hi, I'm Monica, I, I happen to do the synchro thing that is also on campus. So there's a big difference in kind of how we communicate that to other people and how other people would expect us to communicate that. Primer, Greg, any other thoughts as far as? Yeah, I culture? guess when we're talking about gender, um, I, I just, I think it's awesome to see um, I, I think that females are coming out and, and speaking and fighting for what they want. And I think with the changes in strength and conditioning and training, we're seeing the longevity of a lot of female athletes go beyond what we ever knew was possible. You know, we're looking at Serena Williams. She's 37 years old and counting, had a baby, married, nothing stopping her, and she's full speed ahead. Or, uh, you know, there's... Victoria Azarenka, she also had a baby, and she's continuing to play professional. I mean, you just go down the list, soccer players. And, um, and I think it's, it's really cool to see um, female athletes continuing their careers beyond college because when I was playing, it was college or pros. There was no both because by the time you were 22, in, in my sport, you were deemed very old. But now it's college is a route to the pros. And, and I think that's awesome. I think another thing that's really changed is the, the aesthetics. You know, I think that female athletes are being so celebrated and the, the body image conversation is changing. So now you can see the hashtag, strong is beautiful mm -hmm. or strong is sexy. And I, I think that's really cool. Yeah. So. <laughs> From my standpoint, it's a little different. Um, I think there is a big problem. I think it starts from the top. Um, Dr. Bandy's being here opened up my eyes that now that I got a little girl, it's hard for me to find different sports, women's sports on TV. Um, so I try when volleyball championship is on or the women's hockey championships on, I, I just make sure those are always on my TV. But during the regular season before the championships come on, you cannot find a women's volleyball game on TV. And so that starts with that. Um, in the NBA, it, it's tough because it's like you're here and everybody else is here. Mm -hmm. So the conversation we would have about women was never about, you know, oh, this woman did this, unless it's Michelle Obama. But <laughs> 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 it, it, it was definitely like, you know, you, 
you kind of always looked at women as groupies. I mean, it's never talked about, and you understood, you know, somebody's mom or somebody you know who would respect. But for the majority of the part, it was like, oh, shoot, did you hook up with that girl that you saw last night? You're like, dang, she mm-hmm. could have been my cousin. She could have been my business manager. But it's never that first. So I think it's, it is a problem there. But I know there's a bunch of people that she's got, you know, a lot of hashtags. Uh, NBA does one lean in. And um, especially with having a daughter just open up my eyes. It, it's more about respect thing, you know. And I think that learns at home, you know. When you see a woman, you have to respect her first. You see a man, you have to respect him. Everybody deserves your respect before you move forward with anything. Hmm. Very well said. Uh, definitely want to get to some questions. So kind of a final question for the panelists. As athletes who are still in the process of retiring, as we will always be in that process, what do you want from society? And I'll leave it at that. From society? Yeah. Give me some money. <laughs> <laughs> we got an open donation for Greg Oden. Here we now, 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 now. Here we now, now. We did 10, 10, 10. We got a 20, 20, 20. All right, 30 going. That's all. You got a Greg Oden for now. Hey, closed mouths don't get fed. Um, <laughs> no, uh, honestly, just uh, just a respect um, as me, you know. Um, I'm going to be seven feet tall. I'm always going to look like a basketball player, but I'm a person first. So I, I guess in society, when you know, when you see me, if, if you want to come up and say hi, I guess come say hi. But I'm Greg Oden. I'm not the basketball player whose knees didn't work on them. And I'm like, okay, I'm at dinner with my wife and daughter. That nice to meet you too. <laughs> you know, it, it's just I, I guess it goes back to the respect. You know, looking looking at us athletes as as people rather than just the sport we play. I agree with that 100% because a lot of times. When I meet people I've never met before, I'll be checking out at the store. Somebody will look at me and be like, oh my gosh, you must have played sports. And I'll be like, no, I'm a damn engineer. Like, like the first <laughs> thing you say to somebody shouldn't be that they look like they play sports because they look like an athlete. And I, I understand where you're coming from, but like, even though I was an athlete, I'm much more than an athlete. And it's just that awareness, um, all the causes that we're involved in, et cetera. Um, for us, I think it's appreciated when people take interest in those other aspects. Um, and then the other one, just as like a black male, one of my pet peeves is, you know, when somebody meets me and after talking to me, they say, oh my gosh, you're so well spoken. And it sounds like a compliment, but to me, that's, that's like coded language. Like you looked at me and thought, okay, big black dude, played sports, can't talk. And so it's just like from society, those are things that we would appreciate is look at me like the first time you've met me and respect me like somebody who deserves anybody else's respect not only as my athletic accomplishments or not as what you think I am supposed to be. Like, you know, respect us as humans that deserve respect just the same way you would want it. Yeah, I mean, I think going on top of that, I think it's just, I would want to remind society that athletes should not be objectified. And it's really important, especially when they're younger, as they're going through the developmental processes of not only being an athlete, but as a child, that we, we coach them and we parent them as a whole. So we don't just look at them, and this is probably the message more to coaches, is we don't look at them as just an athlete. We have to consider their personality, their feelings, their emotions, their goals, their goals outside of sport, everything. And I think the moment that we start treating and coaching and and caring for athletes from a holistic standpoint, um, we're gonna gonna start seeing some, some major strides in sports. Yeah, I would just have to echo all of that. The same thing for thinking of athletes as people. I mean, I have the same experiences, kind of, but people come and be like, grab my shoulder. It's like, oh, you must have been a swimmer. I'm like, you don't need to touch me, and I am aware. <laughs> um, so, yeah, just that same thing. Like, I am a person before I was a swimmer um, or a former synchronized swimmer. Um, and then just also, I think we are seeing a lot of, like, progress in this, but also seeing female athletes as just athletes. You don't need to define her as a female athlete. She's an athlete. Um, So I think even though we are starting to give more recognition, it's still problematic that we need to separate women as female athletes instead of just athletes. So I think we are seeing a lot of progress in that, but I mean, there's obviously still a lot of momentum that we can take with that. Wow. More than an athlete, no doubt. such rich conversation from you all, incredible perspectives. 
and something that I think I know I've learned it for maybe it's the psychologist in me but this even witnessing this kind of felt a bit therapeutic uh, for for many of us if not all of us just to be able to hear one another engage in this conversation about the very real uh, reality and process associated with retirement and sport and society um, and so for that I thank you but before we you know do high fives and, and hug it out I do want to be able to open it up to the audience. We got about 20 minutes. Um, any, I like to offer it as not asking questions, but what really struck you as some curiosities that now that you have these incredible folks in front of you that you may want to have the opportunity to ask? Yeah. Both. So I think we shouldn't run from our athletic achievements because these are <coughs> special things that happen. But to your point, one thing I see um, when I go to speak places, they'll ask me for a bio or what kind of title I want next to my name. And oftentimes I'll tell them put founder and CEO of the Joshua Perry Family Foundation. But a lot of times next to that, they'll put, you know, former All Big Ten player, former national champion, et cetera. And I never told you to put that. And I appreciate that accolade, but that's not what I identify as. So I think it's special just because of how much pride people have in the university and those achievements. But at the same time, I think for us, like we've heard it enough to want people to be like, okay, yes, like we did all those things, but we are individual people that do other things and we have other accomplishments that we're proud of as well. I think one thing to consider, I agree with you, I, I agree with Josh that it's, it's both and it's twofold. Um, but I think that the one thing to keep in mind is that as human beings, our way of processing and remembering and connecting is slapping labels on people. So it's like, you know, the, they could say, oh, you know, the, the amazing rower from whatever, but we'll also look to somebody else and say like, oh, they're from New York City or oh, they're from the Midwest or oh, they're from California or, or she's an in engineer or whatever, you know, and I think it happens in other scenarios. And I, I think that's just one thing to keep in mind. Um, and if that for some reason, um, and I can understand because it, it has bugged me as well, where you're like, oh, that's all I am, I'm just an athlete. The other way to think about it is, well, I could not have been an athlete. And then you get the pleasure and, and you get the, the reminder that you were an amazing athlete. And so that's, you know, because it could have been something else that wasn't that. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think it's a lot more about um, how you feel about yourself um, because you got to respect yourself and realize you are more than the athlete. But, I mean, I've met a whole bunch of legends who they love hearing about themselves. <laughs> and, you know, they want you to go down their list. And uh, so it, it's like, mm -hmm. for I think you just got to feel it like, okay, you know, yes, I did do those things, but I'm also more than that. And when you can accept that and, and when you can see it, that stuff wouldn't bother you as much. I would just echo Greg and everything that's been said. I think it's both. And I think you're recognizing someone for something extraordinary they did um, athletically. But I think we do a really poor job of listening to people. And like Josh said, like he wanted to be um, recognized for his amazing foundation. You know, he did not want to have the athletic label put on that specific, um, I don't know if it was a speech you were at or something. Um, but we need to listen to people. Like if they want to be recognized, if they want to have those kind of accolades spoken about, then do it. And if they don't, then don't. 
Well, Greg said, he asked if we could go R. <laughs> so, I mean, we're on the trust tree, and you're all going to sign little, like, non-disclosures before you leave here anyway. But, yeah, what's your take on that? It certainly has value as far as we think of sport and society, retirement, and what's going to be left on the table if we do. Um, athletes get paid. What are your thoughts? I think, yes, they should get paid. Um, I think a stipend for every athlete on scholarship, but then I also allow the athletes to use their own likeness. So, okay, the thing is, okay, if the lower sport, I guess, to a university and then the number one football player is getting the same stipend, how can you differenti differentiate that? Let him be able to sell himself, make money on himself. I mean, I know it's going to take a little bit from the university, but is it really? So that's my thought process. It just hit me last week, too. So. <laughs> <laughs> this is fresh from the mind. I was asked that question yeah, recently. I like it. <laughs> fresh from the mind. I, I agree with Greg. I think there's so much gray area to it. Um, and if you are to try and regulate it, it's going to be very hard. Um, but I think if you are to keep the scholarship and stipend the same across all athletes that are on scholarship, I think that's great because you can maintain that equity, especially among all the athletes are putting in the same amount of work and the same amount of recognition should be given to all of them. And then, I mean, obviously Josh is going to be much more recognizable than me. So if, if he is making money off of his name and his image and his likeness, I mean, I can't do anything about that. And I feel like it's his right to, you know, profit off of what he does and how much work he puts into that. Yeah, I'm in the same thought process, especially at a university like Ohio State where there's just, there's a lot of money flowing around. You look at a Nike contract to think like $250 million or something crazy like that. Um, you know, there's money to do it. I have a friend who, um, she played field hockey at Harvard and as a summer internship came up with an investment vehicle that would be useful to student athletes so they'd be able to put the money away for them. Um, it would accrue interest and then when they were ready, whether it was a down payment for a home, they were paying for grad school or whatever expense they had, they could withdraw the money. And I think that's a fantastic solution because a lot of people will tell you that 18 to 22 year olds are very irresponsible with money and they probably don't need it. <laughs> Especially as like, you know, we complain on scholarship, but at the end of the day, we were pretty well taken care of. So um, I, I wouldn't have had very much use for, a, you know, windfall of money at the time, but right now I, I would definitely appreciate it. So um, I think things like that are important. The other thing to look at too um, at Ohio State is I feel like People don't like to say it, but everybody here benefits from great sports programs. Uh, when you look at just attracting students in the first place, like a lot of people come here because they want to be a part of Big Ten championship runs, et cetera. Uh, you look at the licensing deal that the university has, where 85% of licensing goes back to the university, only 15% goes back to um, the athletic department, but a lot of that comes from Nike Apparel, et cetera. Like, there are a lot of benefits, and so to be able to maybe see some of that shift toward student athletes, I think we would all like that. Yeah, I pretty much, um, I, I think we're all on the same page. Um, I, just coming from the media space, it's a conversation and discussion that we have every, I, it feels like every single day, you know, and it's, it's going to be a long battle between the NCAA and, um, and, the, and the athletes. But yeah, I think there should be some sort of compromise. You know, I think that. On one hand, looking back at my, my athletic experience, um, getting sponsored, free gear, free tuition. At the time, it's 40000 Now it's up, up to 70000 a year. It's crazy. Mm. Um, dorm, food, and then even uh, some additional stuff for books and, and rent. I actually came out a little bit with a profit. Um, but I think that there should be the opportunity for some of the bigger name sports and athletes football, basketball, to get a piece of the pie from their likeness. Thanks. Good question. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I'm actually, I'm Joe, I'm Monica's brother. Um, <laughs> <laughs> what a 
up, Joe? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right, Joe. Absolutely. Is here. <laughs> yeah, cool. So, um, I don't think I had any trouble necessarily getting in. For me, it was always a little bit different. Like, I grew up in Lewis Center, Olentangy School, so it's very white. Um, so, I always stuck out a little bit. And I, I always was accustomed to sticking out and embracing that uniqueness. Um, I think just from some of the work I've done with my charity, uh, some kids do struggle because the opportunities aren't there. Like our schools are very well funded. We have a ton of athletic programs within the school. Um, we have other athletic programs that people can send their kids to. Like we have people who pay for their kids to row. Um, that's a hell of an investment because it's not cheap. We have kids who ride horses. Again, horses aren't cheap. Um, so in other areas that are primarily people of color, a lot of those opportunities don't exist. So I think finding a way to combat that is important. Um, but I'm glad you asked that question because I was in the NFL during the time of the national anthem protests, and that was kind of a really wacky time. And um, just personally, I think a lot of it was misconstrued. Um, the narrative was hijacked. I wrote a Bleacher Report um, editorial piece about it, just talking about what we felt as players and kind of the solutions that we saw. But uh, in saying that, I feel like sports has always been a great platform for people of color to be able to speak up about injustices and issues that they see throughout the communities and nationwide. Uh, because a lot of times, you're not gonna be able to have a microphone in your face to talk about those things or reporters asking you questions. And so I think it is really important to have figures like this where you can be in a setting where, where people are receptive and they're listening and you can disseminate messages about some of the injustices that you've seen or the inequalities. You can have ladies up here talking about how gender has played a factor into what their experience was like in sport. I think is really important. So the conversation has to continue I think people have to get more comfortable with it, but um, athletes need to go ahead and run away with that because you know you're helping out your communities, you're helping out, helping out your other athletes, and I think it's really important to talk about. Um, yeah, I would say that more most of my struggle with being someone of color in sport um, came mostly from myself, um, being half Puerto Rican um, in a very white sport, synchro. Um, I always like thought of myself as very different and it was very hard for me sometimes just to be like looking around the pool and nobody looked like me um, and I know there are bigger issues in the world but that was more of like an internal issue that I had to deal with um, but I think it made me a stronger person and made me really just love my heritage and be able to represent Puerto Ricans and there aren't very many in synchro so I think that's pretty neat um, and just be able to represent my culture um, but I think the biggest issue that I faced um, being like a marginalized group in sport is just being a woman in, a woman in sport. Um, and just even if it's just jokes or snide remarks from people that weren't as respectful, just being like, women aren't athletes. Like, even if it's a joke, you know, it still hits home and, you know, it's not something to make light of or joke around about um, as we put in just as much work as other people. Um, and then when we were at World Championships in 2017, we were in Hungary. And a reporter, the main story of that day was synchro. Um, and it was just a picture of girls' butts on the front page of, um, of the, I don't know, whatever they wrote up that day of the, of the World Championships. And they said, it's, fine, it's easy to find beauty in this sport. And how does that reflect <laughs> on women that are there working their asses off to win a national championship, you know? And that was the first time I've been so proud of Synchro, where we come from like just a very respectful and refined group of people and we don't lash out on that kinds of thing. Um, and we saw just a lot of women in sport just posting it on Facebook, posting it on Instagram, saying this is not right. Even if it's a sp like not a very recognizable sport, um, you're still putting this out into the world and people are still seeing that. Um, so I thought that was very awesome to see my sport kind of step up and say this isn't right and that's not how you report on us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I think everybody has a different experience because every sport um, has its own culture. Uh, tennis is a very internationalized sport, so I was lucky that I was surrounded by all sorts of different genders, ethnicities, cultures, 
colors. Um, I was born in Missouri, so I was probably one of like three Asians in the state of Missouri, and the other three were my family. Um, <laughs> but then I was lucky where, uh, so I did struggle with that a little bit, but then when I was 12 and I moved to Florida, I mean, people at my school, we had people from like New Zealand, Australia, Japan, Tokyo, Guam, South America, I mean, the Caribbean. It, so I got really lucky in that. Uh, I guess I, I have a question for you, and, and the fact that you raised that issue, um, do you feel that you are being challenged in integrating your sport because of your ethnicity or culture? And if so, I guess that's, that's disconcerting to me. Yeah, I mean, I think the beauty about sports is that they're, um, for the most part, um, it it blurs the lines in terms of ethnicity, culture, color. Like, you can find commonalities with each other. At least it was in my sport. Um, it didn't matter where you came from. We, it was a very, um, there was a lot of harmony, you know. Uh, but I will say that for anybody that faces those challenges in sport, that's just a little piece of the pie that you're gonna face in the real world because it gets a lot worse. Because when I, when I transitioned and I got into the real world and I was trying to get into sports broadcasting, and then it's, it's one of the most superficial businesses that you'll ever encounter. And at the time, you know, this was 15 years ago, and a lot of people were like, well, you're, so you're a female, you might pose some challenges, you don't really know enough about sports, Prim Saripapat, that's not an American name. You're going to have to change your name because it's not memorable. Um, it's not Americanized enough. You have long hair. At the time, everybody had short hair, so they're like, you're going to have to cut your hair. It's too long and sexy and, and messy and all this stuff. And I'm like, so you're basically telling me not to be myself. <laughs> that's awesome, you know? <laughs> um, so I, <laughs> I guess that's why I posed that question to you, because if you felt those challenges, then I would be concerned, because in the real world, uh, the lines are still very defined and there is a lot of segregation in, in politics. Um, from basketball where it's mostly African American dominated, you see the athletes and you're like, this is not a problem. But once you get to that higher level and you get into those rooms that we all know about, you're the athlete in there and everybody who has the power is not of your color. So the tough part with guys, well that's not a tough part, but guys like Jordan, who started, but LeBron, who aspires and said this, I want to own a team. Like, that's his own, like, that's his mindset. He's letting everybody know that. So I think, for one, we need more athletes to come back and, and be coaches to the youth in the middle level just to show guys who know, uh, women who know, to, to give their perspective and, and show them how to maneuver this world because those rooms is really not run by you. And even at the youth level, when I came up, you know, everybody was on the court, but now it's getting so much privatized. You don't, you don't even see people on those basketball courts that used to be on the side of the road. You know, everybody's in the gym, everybody's getting worked out. And if you realize the people of color, we don't have that money to pay for this scholarship or this membership to this arena. So uh, one thing I would say is just having more athletes come back and give back to help you maneuver the situation and actually teach the sport the right way because a lot of times the the real talent will show even if you're not in those worlds of money and privatization. Mm. Well, I know that we had a question over here, and I wanna, this may take us a little bit past four, and I was a little bit nervous when Nicole said, you have an hour and a half to moderate a panel. I'm like, an hour and a half? <laughs> <laughs> it's like four episodes of Seinfeld. That's going to be a tall, <laughs> that's tall order. Um, and now I wish I had. We had an hour and a half more. You know, frankly, we really filled the time. But I do. I, I can't plead ignorant. I want to be able to sleep tonight if I pretended that I didn't see my man's hand over here. So we'll have my man over here be the final question of the day, and then we'll wrap up.
Um, we'll get you out of here quick. So you <laughs> yeah, uh, still dealing with it. Um, just by asking that question, it kind of hit me a yeah, little bit. Okay. You know, and, and it's just like, yeah, that's that's the realization. You just got to deal with it. Um, the first thing is just being comfortable with yourself and realizing your path is your path. You know, if it's meant for you, it's going to happen. Um, so to to enjoy every day and live your life and try not to worry about that um, is very tough because it does hurt, especially for me because I got out the league right before the TV contract hit. So, you know, minimum for me is 1.2. Now minimum is 2.1 million. I mean, that could have helped, you know? <laughs> so um, really, it's just being comfortable with yourself because, you know, what, what's going to happen for you is going to happen for you. But if you're happy with yourself and you're enjoying life, whatever is planned for you is going to come to you. So I always saw, I was realistic about what my athletic career was going to look like. I always figured myself as a guy who could probably stay in the league for eight to 10 years if I was healthy. But I was probably going to be one of the minimum contract guys. I wasn't expecting to sign a big multi-year deal. So uh, just kind of with that, to be honest, like my vision of what my lifestyle would have been had I played that long and what it's going to be now hasn't changed very much. And it's because I'm confident in my skills and my abilities that I learned here in school. I'm confident in my ability to leverage my network and meet people. And I wasn't going to be the guy who was going to live in a million dollar home. I like nice cars, but I wasn't going to buy anything too crazy. Like I was going to be a guy who was going to go back to the same suburb I grew up in. I was going to live a very nice middle class lifestyle in my mind and I still have the ability to do that so for me like obviously I wish I could have had that money it would have been fantastic but in my mind I could make up a lot of what I wanted to be able to live the same type of lifestyle I want to live <sighs> panels are only as good as your panelists and I've had the great fortune of sitting in an audience where the panel discussion is so boring and you wish it would end and it's like uh how do you like make the panel exciting and you make the panel exciting by having incredible panelists with incredible stories with incredible perspectives about their s stories in this in the in the narratives at large so with that i want to give a very huge round of applause <laughs> And key takeaways, you're each going to have your own, um, but at the end of the day, sport is messy, it's clunky, retirement is, is messy and clunky, and so is life. And I think that is what makes sport one of the many benefits of sport, is that it's this brief little microcosm uh, and playground of how we find out we respond to difficult situations, how we respond to great situations, how we interact with people that we're in competition with, how we interact with people that we're not in competition with, how we receive feedback, how we give feedback. Sport is a microcosm of that, which then allows us after retirement and while we're still playing to be able to engage in the society as rock star, incredible individuals. And I think these four folks are a testament to that. So I thank you all for the time. I thank you, Nicole, for the opportunity for this panel to be here. Um, and once again, let's hear it one more time for this group of individuals.